Okay, so um, thank you very much everyone for um, joining us for this uh, November version of the uh, CPSG, uh, part of the CPSG webinar series. And um, this evening, I'm delighted that we've been able to um, cajole, press gang, persuade in other ways, um, Professor Phil Seddon uh, of the Department of Zoology, University of Otago. Um, who has been instrumental in um, uh, the development of a number of um, SSC specialist groups, sits on a number of boards and committees, and most importantly and most relevant to today's webinar, uh, has been very heavily involved, uh, integrally involved in the development of the conservation translocation specialist group and the development of guidelines that came from that specialist group. And we're going to take this opportunity to uh, get a bit of an overview of those, and in particular, some of the, the sort of the rationale behind the guidelines, um, and hear some of Phil's perspectives um, on those guidelines. And we can then also reflect afterwards on um, the, the, the resonance with um, uh, that we're planning in general for conservation, the conservation of threatened species. So Phil, on that note, I'll hand over to you if you want to share your screen and, and I will shut up and I will watch the chat room. So as I say, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat box, leave your mics on mute just now, and then we'll take uh, questions, um, uh, open mic questions at the end. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you're seeing my screen now and so everything's okay. We can get through. Excellent. So thank you very much, Jamie, for um, inviting me to do this. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good night around the world, wherever people are coming in from. What I want to do over the next uh, short while is really, um, I think it's useful to think about where the, the history of things have come from. So I want to start with kind of history of reintroductions and really the development of this kind of discipline of reintroduction biology. I want to use that to look at the creation of the reintroduction guidelines and how they now encompass quite a wide range of things that we call conservation translocations. And then use those to maybe just touch on some aspects of planning for conservation translocations under risk and, un and uncertainty. I've, I've sort of engineered some breaks in here where I may just kind of pose a question uh, if, if there are no, no responses or if people can just carry on, that's fine. But as Jamie said, We'll, we'll keep this informal and please do ask us to do this with that one. So I'm going to start with um, a picture of the kind of ubiquitous hot sauce bottle talking about reintroductions. And this is uh, produced by the um, McElhaney Company. And one of the, the key members of that company, that um, family, was Ed McElhaney. And Ed was, as well as a hot sauce manufacturer, he was very interested in uh, wildlife. And he became interested in the plight of the snowy egrets, which were had populations in Louisiana which were rapidly disappearing because of a hat trade. Um, and he founded a wildlife refuge called Bird City, but importantly for our purposes, he actually started a captive breeding program. He was actually releasing these, translocating these snowy egrets. He was credited with actually saving the species from extinction at the time. Around about the same time, on the other side of the world in New Zealand, was a translocated Irishman called Richard Henry. Uh, amongst his many jobs, Richard Henry uh, at one stage was a warden of islands off the really remote and rugged New Zealand South Island West Coast in Jordan. Richard Henry was a, a keen naturalist as well, and he took a great interest in the bird life around him at that stage. And he was dismayed to find that stoats, introduced stoats, were invading into Fjordan from the east. And as they came, they were, they were starting to decimate the, the bird life was around that region. So he took it upon himself to try and rescue as many of these birds as he could by moving uh, kakapo, so an iconic flightless nocturnal parrot, and of course the 
the Kiwi onto an offshore island, Resolution Island. And you moved an incredible number now when we think about how these populations are. Over 700 were recorded being moved off to Resolution Island. So he was translocating them really to save them. Um, as, a, as a footnote, it turned out Resolution Island wasn't far enough off the mainland and Stokes could swim that. So the Stokes did eventually get onto the island and remove all the kakapo and kiwi from there. There were still kakapo uh, in Fiordland uh, up until relatively recent times. And this is one of the last of them uh, named after Richard Henry. So Richard Henry Kakapo. And he's been held by Don Merton, who is a reintroduction hero, really, in New Zealand. And it, just note in this image that these Don and Richard Henry Kakapo are about the same age, as far as we can tell. Um, Don, Don's actually credited with saving about three species of New Zealand uh, birds. So Kakapo uh, is one of them, Chatham Island, Black Robin was another in South Island Saddleback. And I'll mention South Island Saddleback as we go through as an example. I just want to give, um, frame the talk a bit with what for some people might be a fairly provocative statement. So how society feels about, and I've paraphrased here, how they feel about conservation translocation will depend on the degree to which we want to shape or even create future ecosystems. And I think this kind of captures the current thinking about ecosystem restoration and our gradual move away from thinking about a strict preservationist viewpoint or requiring these kind of arbitrary historical target states for restorations. There was a bit of a gap between the work of Ed McElhaney and Richard Henry, but uh, through the 60s, 70s, into the 80s, there were a number of very high profile reintroduction programs. So Golden Lion Tamarin in Brazil, Peregrine Falcon in North America, and Arabian Oryx in Oman. This last one was uh, championed by Mark Stanley Price, who in 1988 became the founding chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Reintroduction Specialist Group. Around about the same time, Mark wrote an influential book called Animal Reintroductions, using his experience with the Arabian Oryx in Oman as a case study. The Reintroduction Specialist Group had as its mission to use these reintroduction tools uh, for restoration to, to combat that loss of biodiversity. And one of the very first things they came out with was the 1998 uh, IUCN guidelines on reintroductions, very slim little booklet, a little ubiquitous blue booklet, if you've ever seen that. And it was really kind of a you know, sensible back of the envelope, um, things that you might want to think about or consider if you were thinking or planning of a, a translocation of some kind. Of course, we've seen an explosion in the use of reintroduction and other kinds of movements of animals to try and restore populations. We've seen it, it spread taxonomically, we've seen it, seen it spread geographically. We can kind of summarize some of those patterns uh, just in this figure here. So the, the bar graph up on the um, top right is really comparing the proportions of uh, the different taxa that we choose to translocate for conservation purposes compared to their prevalence in nature. So we can see that the black bars are much higher than the, the white bars for birds and mammals. So it means we disproportionately put a lot of effort on birds and mammals. We can see that for things like fish and certainly things like invertebrates, we're not nearly doing as much as we, we perhaps could be. And we can see this kind of taxonomic bias run through all sorts of conservation work, even through research work. And it's, it's, no, it's no mystery, really. Um, people are inherently attracted towards birds and mammals more than towards fish and insects. But I think it's, a, it's an imbalance which is slowly being addressed. The other thing we can see on this figure is uh, the IUCN regions and the, the circles on the map indicate the, the prevalence of translocations as a conservation tool in different parts of the world. And we can see that North America, uh, Western Europe, uh, and certainly Oceania, so Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific uh, are high impact areas. A lot of activity going on there. In New Zealand, um, 
as it indicates here, we've got 55 bird species, over a thousand releases. And we've got a, a number of uh, taxa that only exist as translocated populations here. So it's been a very important tool for us uh, to really address some of our, our challenges and issues. On the back of all this translocation activity, we've seen the rise in the kind of the associated science. So the emerging discipline of reintroduction biology, which is really the study, <coughs> excuse me, of the process of population establishment, growth, regulation, and persistence, and the, the information that feeds back into practice. Uh, just thinking about those stages, I'll, I'll mention them again as we go on. So it's worth kind of looking at seeing what I mean. We can think about any stylized reintroduction or translocation effort as uh, following perhaps a logistic population growth. So we see on the bottom axis, it's time. And the, uh, the, the y-axis there is the, the way that population is changing. So at point one, that's when you would be releasing founders. At two, you would be hoping that those founders would survive and start to establish in the area that you've chosen for them. By three, you're getting growth in that population through breeding by founders, survival of their offspring and breeding by other generations. And then you're ultimately working towards that level four where there's some sort of regulation around some kind of carrying capacity. Um, Doug Armstrong and I, so Doug is a translocated Canadian working in the North Island in New Zealand. Uh, we wrote a, a chapter in a book a few years ago, which is really setting out the history of reintroduction biology. So a lot of the things I've been talking about up till now, <clears throat> you, could, you could find in more detail there. One of the things we showed was that there was this exponential increase in research outputs. Um, these are peer-reviewed outputs. So there's a lot of research activity that's going on there. And the other thing Doug and I have done over our careers is trying to make the case that research and management should really be closely integrated. So translocations offer opportunities really to conduct experiments in population biology, behavioral ecology, conservation biology, anything you can think about. And the learnings from those experiments and those that research will improve reintroduction practice or translocation practice. And uh, reintroductions have, a, have a, a reputation, if you like, for being reasonably low success. So there's certainly room to improve these things. So we come back to our, our slim little booklet from a number of decades ago, and it, it soon became apparent that this little slim book of guidelines uh, was really going to be insufficient to kind of capture the full range of complexity of modern translocation practice. Um, and nor did it kind of encompass the full range of things that people were doing under that translocation banner. So in through 2011, 12 and 13, there was a a, um, a task force that worked, again, under the, the leadership of Mark Stanley Price to really completely revise those guidelines. So in 2013, the new guidelines came out, the IUCN guidelines for introductions and other conservation translocations, a much more detailed book, uh, booklet that was trying to really consider a lot more aspects. And you'll notice the title there, um, IUCN guidelines for reintroductions and other conservation translocations. So this is really an explicit acknowledgement that reintroductions is really just one of the things you might do under this title. And that there are other kinds of movements and release of uh, wild plants and animals that you would do for conservation purposes. And this, this change was really acknowledged in uh, 2018, where we had what was the second International Wildlife Reintroduction Conference at Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. And at that time, uh, the current chair, Axel Morenschlager, uh, announced that the IUCN reintroduction specialist group was going to become the IUCN conservation translocation specialist group. So we've got a CTSG to go along with the CPSG. Hopefully there's no confusion. We'll see how that goes. So I've been talking about reintroduction, I've been talking about translocations. Uh, I think it's useful to kind of think about what it is we're talking about. Um, translocation is the overarching term. So translocation is defined as a human mediated movement of living things from one area with release in another. 
So we can think about a, a kind of a spectrum of translocation activities and we can we can create a framework for defining exactly what it is that's being done by asking and answering a series of questions. So the first question you could ask is say, well, you're releasing something, is this release intentional? And the answer might be no. So there are such things as accidental translocations. We might think about rats stowing away on ships, certainly human mediated, there's movement, there's release at the other end, but it wasn't intended. We're more interested in things that are intentional. So if we said, yes, we did mean to release something, then you can ask another question saying, well, why were you releasing this? Is the main reason for releasing it either of these two things? So improving the status of the animal that, or plant that you're releasing or, or putting out there or restoring natural ecosystem functions or processes. So th this kind of encompasses what we would call conservation. We could go, well, no, we're not actually doing this for conservation. There are all sorts of reasons why you might translocate <coughs> uh, organisms without it being for conservation purposes. And this is not an exhaustive list, but you could think about things like non-lethal control of problem animals, moving from one place to another, maybe rehabilitation releases. The, the image there is of African penguins um, being rehabilitated after oiling, uh, movement onto and to new islands um, to avoid re-oiling uh, uh, as part of that rehab. There might be uh, releases for commercial or recreation purposes, so restocking game species. Uh, down in the, the bottom image there relates to religious releases. So in many parts of Southeast Asia, you can gain credit for releasing birds or mammals or fish. And so a lot of temples have these release prayer ceremonies. Uh, a lot of strange things are going on there. Um, people are gathering wildlife from the, the near countryside, bringing it to these temples. People pay a small amount and release them, but they, you get things like releasing um, saltwater fish into fresh water and things like that. Uh, there might be animal rights liberation. So, you know, these mass releases of, of mink. Uh, there might be aesthetic releases. So in New Zealand, we have an avifauna in our cities that looks very much like uh, the UK, we have song, song thrushes and blackbirds and sparrows because people were trying to recreate an English kind of country garden feel here. Or there could be other reasons. And the, the last example there is the strangest one I'd found. It's this idea um, of bio warfare, if you like. So there were experiments during World War II where they actually moved bats from Texas to California to experiment with the idea of bat bombs. So they the idea was that they would tie a small incendiary device to the, the legs of hundreds of bats, drop them over mainland Japan. The bats would fly down, find refuge under the wooden eaves of the houses, gnaw off the incendiary devices, which would ignite and set fire to the houses. Fortunately, they, they never uh, actually implemented this one. But if we say, actually, we're doing this for conservation purposes, so our answer to that question is yes, then what we're doing is a conservation translocation, and that's really what we're concerned with here today. We can start ask the next question and say, well, where are you releasing these things? You're doing it for conservation, but where, where's the release site? Is it within the indigenous range? The guidelines define indigenous range as known or inferred distribution generated uh, from historical records or physical evidence, written, verbal, whatever. So you could think about it as historical range, but historical is a bit, uh, can be a bit of a tortured uh, term. I, I can suggest a question for a quick break here, and it's one that's been posed to me in a number of instances. It's saying what, if any, would be the time limit for a reintroduction? What I mean by that is we say, well, a species used to be here, but it disappeared. So should we be able to bring it back if it disappeared five years ago, if it disappeared 10 years ago, what about 50 or 100, 500 or 1,000 years? Is there a kind of a time limit on this? Just to open that up, if anyone have any comments or uh, questions or whether they've encountered that as, a, as a, maybe an issue in things that they've been involved with. 
Thank you very much for that, Phil. And if you'd like to ask a question, I can, I'm just bringing up all everyone's videos. So you can actually turn your mic on if you'd like to um, give a comment or a response to that, or you could also um, write it in the chat box. And I'm looking across for mics that might be on. I was going to go to myself then because I can see my mic is off. That's not really very helpful. Um, anybody want to come back with some some thoughts on that? Whether there is a, a is a time limit, or whether there should be one. Helen, what? and then oh. Dura, Dura um, J afterwards. I guess yeah, one I'm of the joking. things you would have to think about is how much the landscape has changed since the species was there. So if there's been big changes in land use, even if that's happened very quickly or over a long period of time, that's going to change how viable it is to reintroduce the species. And it also depends what your end goal is. And it's kind of a similar question that you think about with any kind of restoration ecology is what are you trying to get back to? And that what period of time are you trying to get back to? And that will be different in different systems in terms of what's feasible as well. Yeah, Helen, I think that's exactly right. So uh, the, I'd, I'd encountered this when thinking about uh, northern bald ivis restoration in Europe and Austria and Germany. And people are saying, well, these things have been gone for 500 years, so they, you know, they're not part of the, the avifauna anymore. But your point about the focus should really be on what is the match between that species and that, that site where you want to put them. I think, and I think the guidelines start to push more into that direction. So being less kind of concerned about whether they were there or when they were there and more about whether that area is going to be suitable for them. And as you say, what is it that you're trying to achieve by putting some things back? Um. Juro J, uh, Juro J, um, I'm sorry, I've, I've, unfortunately I've, I've muted you. Can you unmute yourself and, and you make a comment <laughs> and then we'll come to yeah, Bob afterwards. Right. Yeah, Go that's right. I think she, yeah, she's on track. The question was, should there be, or shouldn't there be? Um, well, I think there shouldn't be a time limit. The question should be no. There shouldn't be a time limit. But our observations are valid. Those observations are what will guide the steps to be taken. The question that I think will arise is more, why should that reintroduction be undertaken? For what purpose? Is it for conservation? Is it for non-conservation? Why is it necessary? But I think whatever the time limit is, like you said, if you can consider what changes are taking place and how they are, the animal can fit in or can be made to fit in, it can still be done. That is just the addition to the comments um, the first speaker has made. Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right, I think. I think it would be dangerous to assume that just because it was there, then the conditions will, will be appropriate for it. So you, it really does throw that emphasis right back on saying what's the match between the species and, and the habitat. Okay, sorry, Jane, Phil, I don't question. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, Phil, there's there's one more question yeah. from, from Bob about in the chat about um curious about time scale that you brought up and also but but also the place in the trophic system. So that sort of that spatial uh aspect as well, um, where you've got extent extant plants seed dispersers etc and all those parts if all those parts are missing you know what what level is the right level to 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 intervene at or i suppose on the other side of that is are, are there levels where it's not right to intervene at i, I think yeah it's, it, there's no clear um set of rules for that i don't think um the what what the guidelines have done is put a lot more emphasis on saying what are the conditions like in the proposed release area? Are these going to meet the requirements for that species that you're, you're targeting in the long term, across all age groups, all stages, thinking not only about the species, but also about <clears throat> uh, things it's reliant on, things that it might be competing, you know, competing with or it's predated by, and also 
it, it, it even pushes that out and says, well, might, this, might these conditions be good into the future as well? So we will talk a bit about the impacts of climate change and, and these kinds of things. Fantastic, Phil. Should we um, carry on? Yeah, sure. So if we said, okay, yes, we're releasing this into an area where it used to be, we can ask, the, we, we can say, well, we're doing, we're restoring the population. We can ask the question, are there still any of them present in that release area? And if we went, yes, there's still some there, then what we're doing is reinforcement. And reinforcement's this intentional movement and release into a population of conspecifics. And the example I've put up there is kaki or black stilt, which is probably the rarest wading bird in the world. Central South Island, New Zealand, um, relies on these large, very dynamic braided river systems that are completely filled with almost every exotic predator that we've got. So there's an ongoing captive breeding and release program to reinforce that population or to keep it sustainable in the wild while we tackle the, the issue of landscape scale predator control. You, you might be uh, releasing or reinforcing a population um, in order to change the demographics or to change the, or to add some genetic diversity. In there. It also gets called augmentation or supplementation in some, some places. If you're saying, well, no, they've all gone from that area. It doesn't need to be a global extinction. It could just be a local disappearance. Then what you're doing is a reintroduction. And reintroduction is that intentional movement and release inside the indigenous range from which that species disappeared. I mentioned Don Merton saving the South Island Saddleback. This is the South Island Saddleback here. It was really a population that was uh, once right across the mainland South Island. It was reduced by predation to a single offshore island with about 23 birds. That island got invaded by rats. And Don and others in the Wildlife Service New Zealand at that time this uh, frantic translocation where they caught as many of these animals as these birds they could and moved them onto other islands that didn't have rats on them. So all the South Island saddleback we have now, which probably amounts to um, many hundreds, really come from that small population, which we, we nearly lost. So we touched on the idea of kind of change, uh, habitat change. Things might, might change since you, um, since you lost a species from an area. And I've mentioned in New Zealand that one of our biggest habitat changes is the fact we've got all these um, exotic species in here. We've got a whole range of direct predators. We've got a whole range of things that are changing habitat as well, sort of browsers and grazers. So they are completely changing the habitat suitability of an area. So we can't assume that any particular area on the mainland is suitable for a native bird species, for instance, just because that bird species used to be there. And of course, on the top of that, we have climate change and habitat suitability. And we really ask the question, does climate change sort of change everything in this? We, we see changes in temperature, changes in rainfall, changes in the extent of, of land due to sea level rise. And these attendant risks, uh, disease, invasive species, phenological mismatch. We started to see that effect on endemic species. So I did some work in Saudi Arabia. This is the Arabian Peninsula, and we can see off on the side there, the, in red are the distributions of a couple of Arabian endemic bird species, the Yemen serra and the Yemen warbler. Very restricted distribution, not a surprise <clears throat> why their distribution looks like that. If you look at the topographic map, you can see that these are high altitude uh, specialists. So as the land is warming around them, getting drier due to climate change, these things are uh, having a restricted distribution, they're effectively falling off the top of their distribution. Similar thing happening in other species. We can go to Australia, so the golden bowerbird is a Queensland mountain endemic, and it's restricted to very high, relatively cool areas in Queensland. As these warm, it's unable to naturally spread across um, intervening hot uh, lower lands in order to get to appropriate climates further south. So the question is, what can we do in these sort of situations? Back in 2008, a group of people came out and said, well, one of the things we could do is actually think about moving species to sites where they do not currently occur or maybe have never occurred. So 
in response to the challenges posed by climate change, um, where species are getting trapped in areas which are unsuitable, maybe we need to think about these more radical movements. The idea is not new. There's a kind of a prescient paper back in 1985 said something similar in relation to nature reserves. We're 85, we were, we were starting to worry about climate change, but it really wasn't on everyone's radar the way it is today. Um, Robert Peters and Joan Darling really postulated that actually you, you may have reserves, protected areas that uh, become increasingly unsuitable for the species they were created to protect. And that those range limits might shift and you might have to think about moving individuals into new reserves. <clears throat> and I've added in there that some of those reserves might be outside the current species range limit. As you might expect, the sort of idea of moving things where they've never been before uh, wasn't necessarily well received by the invasion biologists. And there was a pretty vigorous debate and a lot of pushback. Some, some of the comments um, from the top there increased consideration of this assisted colonization will create more conservation problems than it solves and potentially poses large, great and largely incalculable risks, that was the suggestion. Um, the other is potential of this assisted colonization to preserve species is kind of directly in conflict with the idea and intention with its potential to make things worse by uh, unleashing invasions by the species you're moving around. And as uh, Mark Schwartz and Tara Martin suggested, this was a pretty major diversion from traditional conservation. Nevertheless, it was something that we felt we had to encompass in the guidelines. So we can come back up and just say, well, are you doing this conservation translocation in the indigenous range? If the answer is no, then what you're doing is a conservation introduction. And if the aim of this conservation introduction is to actually avoid a population at any scale going extinct due to some factors uh, affecting it at, at it, the location, you're doing an assisted colonization. Another way of thinking about this, translocation of species to favorable habitat beyond their native range to protect them from human-induced threats such as climate change. So the such as is important there. So climate change isn't the only driver of this. We made it broader in the guidelines by saying, well, it's the intentional movement of release outside the indigenous range to avoid extinction of populations of the focal species. Um, but it's not really so new and radical as it turns out. In fact, in New Zealand, we've been doing assisted colonization for a while. We just haven't been calling it that. So again, with our kakapo example, where they're threatened on islands that get invaded or in the mainland that get invaded by predators, what we've been doing as a very effective conservation tool is marooning kakapo and other birds on predator-free offshore islands. Um, nor have kind of NGO and other groups kind of waiting for official sanction to do these things. So a high profile example is the Torea pine, the Torea taxifolia, which is in a kind of Pleistocene refuge down in Florida, which is becoming increasingly unsuitable under climate change. And the friends of Torea have taken it upon themselves to actually assist the colonization of areas up in Georgia, which is more appropriate climate. And there's been uh, work on assisted colonization and more of a research sense in the UK looking at butterfly movements and just how, how fast they would move naturally versus what they would need to do to keep up with shifting uh, isotherms. Even in Australia, um, Tasmanian devils, which is an endemic species occupying, uh, currently occupying just Tasmania. But subject to um, a very strange disease you may be aware of, the Tasmanian facial tumor disease, a Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease, which is um, a, a socially transmitted cancer, actually, because the devils fight and they, they bite each other in the face and they inject one devil will inject this cancer into the cancer cells into another devil. And it's decimating populations uh, really in wave going from northeast to southwest. So one of the approaches has been to use assisted colonization to create a disease-free population of devils on Mara Island where devils have never been before. So that's assisted colonization. Up till now, we've been talking about a situation where we still have things 
of that species around somewhere. Maybe they're trapped in a bad area. Maybe there's only a few restricted populations. But what about the idea of um, actual extinctions, global extinctions, because you've lost everything. What are our options there? Again, using a, a Saudi Arabian example, there used to be uh, an endemic ostrich, the Arabian ostrich. And by the time people were making recordings or um, recording distributions of these things, it, it persisted in two populations, one down in the south, one up in the north. You can see in the circles there. The southern population disappeared around the, the turn of uh, the 1900s. And the northern population, the last animal was, was shot in Wadi Surha near Jordan in about the 1950s. But ostriches do interesting and useful things in the desert and it was felt it, was, it would be useful to bring ostriches back. So uh, the Saudi Arabians replaced the lost Arabian ostrich with uh, animals, closely related animals from Sudan. This is them in the Mahazad Asad Reserve. So this is another kind of translocation that we need to think about within our guidelines. So we can add another one in there, another conservation introduction. Say, well, you might actually be doing something because you want to perform an ecological function that's been lost by the extinction of the original form. This is uh, Lonesome George, a male Pinta Island tortoise in the Galapagos who died in 2012, about 102 years of age, as far as people could tell. He marked the last of the kind of Pinto Island tortoises, um, <clears throat> which was sad because it's a, an extinction, but it also had ecological implications. These giant tortoises do interesting things when they trample and browse and graze the vegetation. They create uh, an environment known as tortoise turf. So the way that they, they trample and, and eat vegetation actually encourages native herb species and discourages weedy species. So when you lose this grazing and trampling pressure from uh, the islands, then weedy species will reinvade. So the best example we have of this ecological replacement translocation really comes from uh, these kinds of islands and these sort of giant tortoises. So we've seen a number of successful translocations uh, to Round and Rodriguez Islands in Mauritius. Jamie, you know more about those. Um, with animals coming from the Seychelles and Madagascar and to Pinter Island, where we lost Lonesome George, from other islands with other species in the Galapagos. And the views on conservation introductions are kind of coming around a bit. Um, and there's a feeling that actually this could be a useful tool as many species might actually need this to cope with some of the pressures and that things like ecological replacements do offer some kind of promise to mitigate extinction events um, that there's growing evidence that uh, conserving ecological interactions is actually really important to maintain biodiversity so ecological replacements could be a really valuable part of that restoration toolkit but it, there's always a balance in there so again, Mark Schwartz and Tara Martin saying, well, actually the risk to the recipient systems might be viewed by stakeholders as sufficiently large as to make these things never acceptable as a valid conservation strategy. So it's an interesting discussion there. We, it kind of brings us onto the idea of um, uh, risk and uncertainty. What, I, what I'm just showing you now is really, um, it came from another a chapter that um, Doug and I were doing, really looking at um, rewilding and the whole kind of spectrum of activities. And what we did was put on a, a, an axis of the probability of project outcomes. So we can think about risk as being the likelihood uh, that something un uncertain or undesirable would happen and the Im impact of that if it did happen. So we can kind of flip that around and say, well, we could think about risk and uncertainty in terms of probability of having the project outcomes that we desire. We can put different kinds of translocations along this, this spectrum. And we can see that something like a reinforcement probably in inherently has a higher likelihood of success. And the reason for this is that you've already got a species of uh, you've got conspecifics in a population, so you know that their habitat is good or could be made good. 
you know enough about the, the species in that area that you can probably manage them. Reintroductions become a little more risky depending on what it is you're doing. So if it's a recent re extinction in an area and you're reintroducing some lower trophic species, it's probably got less uncertainty, high likelihood of success than putting in something like top order predators where there's a lot of societal resistance or ecosystem engineers with the potential to really change systems. We can think about ecological replacements moving us a little bit further along and that, this gets us into the, the realms of rewilding in some areas. So you could be uh, trying to restore the ecosystem by actually using domesticated descendants as we've seen in some rewilding uh, projects. Probably not, not uh, a lot of risk or uncertainty there, a lot's known about those. Or you could use close relatives, but you, some people are proposing ecological replacements using taxonomically very different species would carry greater risk. Along the bottom there, um, just for completeness, we, we touched on the idea of de-extinction, which I could talk about if anyone has any questions about that. And really um, the idea that the purpose of de-extinction is to create functional proxies that would be ecological replacements. We can see that this moves us a little further along that uh, risk and uncertainty, right up to the idea of this genomic engineering where you might be creating uh, hybrid uh, elephants, um, mammoth hybrids in order to achieve some conservation goal. Well, yep. can I, can I, I'm being very rude and, and um, just to ask, because it, it, could you also put an axis um, on that um, in terms of likelihood of acceptance, um, thinking about sort of Tara Martin's um, comment before. Uh, and I just wonder how well that would actually map going from reinforcements down to those, you know, uh, the extinction, although there will obviously be differences that, you know, you could imagine that you're becoming less acceptable um, or likelihood that there's going to be more people against it uh, as you move down that uh, the page. Yeah, it, it actually um, it relates to something I've been part of a working group um, looking at something what they call intended consequences. It's really thinking about the policy environment around genetic interventions for conservation. And one of the things um, <clears throat> I proposed for thinking about that was actually to create a whole series of axes to, on, on different things, the likelihood of success, the, how bad would things go if they went wrong, how much genetic modification is taking place. And you, what you can do then is you can, you can go to any stakeholder group and say, any given project, you can map them along any of those axes and, and, and decide which of those features might be deal breakers for a project going ahead. So something like this, exactly what you're saying, you take, you take this one axis, but you can add other ones in there that might be, you know, just what's the scale of something that you're proposing to do? What are, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen if it went wrong? How, how likely it is, is it that we could pull back from this if we started it? So they create a whole lot of things that you would, you would say, well, given a reinforcement, it would map here and here and here, whereas you're doing genomic engineering, then it would map somewhere else. And you could create a kind of a landscape of acceptance or risk. And you, like you could imagine entering a kind of red zone where you're saying, actually, this would be a deal breaker. This, the uncertainty or the scale or the amount of uh, manipulation or the, or the likelihood of um, something going wrong is just too great. So yeah, I, I think there's absolutely scope to be doing that. Um, I'll move on now just to the last section, but I'm happy to take any other questions about that framework, about the defining things, about um, uh, anything up to this point. Sorry, you can, yeah, you can... Uh... Put your microphones on if you want to, and I can queue you up, or you can write in the chat room. We'll give you a, a few seconds just to think about that. Uh, and whilst you do, one, one thing that's sort of coming out loud and clear to me from what you've said so far, Phil, is which does resonate very much with any sort of planning you're involved in, 
is that need for clarity of objectives, you know, re really what you fundamentally care most about. And those views that were put forward by those, those quotes from different, different uh, researchers, you know, many of them just reflect um, that, that, you know, they're neither wrong nor right. They're just different perspectives on the same situation and, and, and highlights what people, what others may value, which may well differ from you. There's no reason to say that conservation is the value to, um, to hold highest in all situations and not everyone's going to hold that. Um, but that's really something that, that comes out very powerfully from what you, what you've said. Um, did anybody have any, any questions you want to ask or should we keep going? I think we'll keep going, Phil. Keep going, okay. So this is um, a slightly simplistic framework, but really formalizing the process of kind of translocation planning, uh, this flowchart and guidelines. And um, we can see exactly what Jamie was just saying. We, we, you'd need to have a lot of clarity over why is it that you're needing to do anything? So what is that conservation situation? What's the driver for having to think about doing something anyway? And then being very, very explicit about what it is you're trying to achieve. And it's surprising how often that, that step can be missed or not well communicated to the range of people that need to be involved with it. If you can get everyone on board and understanding what, what it is you're trying to achieve, you can then move on to the very important next step of saying, well, what are the alternative ways of achieving this? And they might be translocation, they might be non-translocation. So this is a this is a framework you could take for any kind of maybe conservation planning. And, and Jamie has been involved with um, in a, a key part of some of the training workshops we've done in relation to the, this kind of sequence of, of events and process. So some of, some of this kind of process has really, really come out of the learnings from this reintroduction biology, which has been calling for, for um, several things over the years. So the idea of um, defining or designing translocations as opportunities to test hypotheses or compare alternative approaches. Um, thinking about what, what process or what stage are you really focused on and how we need to be thinking uh, about you know, establishment stages, persistent stages, but also thinking about uh, multiple populations, so meta-population processes, and ecosystem level impacts. So we can't just be focusing on a single species as part of this. And, and the last is to, to think about how this information really feeds back into, um, into, into those learnings. So we can, we can work our way down this thing and think about um, designing something in order to assess alternatives or test hypotheses and then undertaking those with appropriate monitoring that lets you gather the information you need to answer the questions you want, maybe in a, in a cycle, so this adaptive management cycle, with some sort of output that's going to inform things. So um, a couple of years ago, there was a kind of a review about how well are we doing this within a, a conservation translocation framework. And it looked at uh, trends over time, from 1995 up to 2015. And what this, this figure is showing you is really the kind of temporal trends and the level of the question addressed. So we can see here that uh, each of those lines are kind of trend lines. You can see that there's um, a lot of emphasis on the establishment phase. So you're worried about you know, releasing your founders and you're hoping that they're going to survive and settle in some area. So there's still a great attention on that. There's a lot of attention being put on the persistence. So are these populations going to persist over the time? But still, we're not seeing a lot of in, in, um, emphasis or a, um, research or focus on these other two levels. Thinking about multiple populations and thinking about um, the ecosystem-wide things. So there's still a bit of, of learning and uh, development to do there. This next one looks at the idea of whether there are some hypotheses being framed in advance. So you're making hypothesis, you're making predictions about what should happen as a result of your translocation or the performance of the species when you go out there or the impact it's going to have on that ecosystem. And in, what we've seen over history is a lot of 
a lot of reintroduction activity, a lot of translocation activity has been a kind of a, a one-off management activity. Someone wakes up one morning with a great idea about doing something, they get some animals and they throw them out there and they come back a number of years later and see if they're still there. So we're losing those opportunities to learn as we go. And one of the key ways to do that is to actually think right in advance about what it is that you expect to happen, uh, what, is it, what it is that you could learn from this. And we are seeing this, the trend line there indicates that we are getting much more uh, leverage on this. So people are focusing more at the front end in that, that kind of planning, goal statement, hypothesis, testing. The last one here is um, thinking about um, <clears throat> whether those management actions are kind of considered implicitly, explicitly, or not at all. And there hasn't been much kind of movement in here. Um, that is whether you're, you're thinking about alternative actions, you're comparing alternatives you can do in order to come up with the best possible way of doing it. And just to kind of round this off, I can, I can illustrate it with by just taking the adaptive management part of that equation. And, and thinking about how that would work. Um, so at the, the top there, we've got the important thing, defining the problem. So having some explicit statement of what it is you're trying to achieve. Then we move over to modeling and predicting. So using it, all available information to make some prediction about the performance of maybe the alternative actions that you want to undertake. You turn those into uh, some sort of management action and the monitoring required to really test those, you implement it, you monitor those outcomes appropriate and you focus on the best performing option. Probably makes a bit more sense if I kind of um, fill that in with an, a detail. So defining the problem in terms of a translocation, it might be something around, do we maximize population growth through the release of captive or wild founders? Because it's been the suggestion that um, uh, wild to wild translocations may have higher success rates because the animals already adapted to conditions. On, on the other hand, uh, sometimes captivity allows you to train or select the, the most appropriate individuals. The model and prediction there would be, in this case, we'd say, well, actually, wild founders, we, we predict they would have a higher post-release survival and lower dispersal. So we would expect that population to grow faster uh, using wild founders. Then we can set up uh, one of two ways. We could do an active adaptive management where if we had the individuals and the time, the resources, you release matched founder groups coming from both captivity and from the wild and you directly compare their performance. Or this passive adaptive management, which is often a bit more common, where you would, for example, release only wild founders and assess them against your predicted expectations. Implementation is often obviously releasing those chosen founders. You monitor the outcomes. And again, your monitoring needs to be completely directed towards what it is you need to learn about that population. <clears throat> it's been another thing that um, has been pushed over the years where initially a lot of reinteraction attempts, there was no monitoring, so there was no learning. Then when there was monitoring, it was kind of post hoc. People would come in after a program and go in there and try and measure some things to see what was happening. But it, there's a lot of things you can measure, not all of them are informative or useful. So the, really the push is now to design your monitoring right up front where you are very clear about what it is you want to learn about that population as it establishes, grows and, and goes through regulation. So obvious things are vital rates like survival, dispersal and, and uh, movement like that and, and breeding. And you may be doing that in, in our example here, you know, testing against predictions or between groups or the expectations. Then obviously you focus on those best performing options and roll it through. That brings me to the end of um, this kind of part. I've got some other bits about rewilding if people want to talk about that or de-extinction, but um, I realize we're right up, we're coming up to that hour. I want to leave enough time for a discussion if there is some. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Phil. Thank you so much there. I know we've got a couple of questions to go to straight off in the, the, the chat. 
Um, so um, Jura J is asking about the, um, the, 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 the problem of um, species, I think, becoming invasive um, where you have assisted colonizations. Is that right? Is that a right interpretation, Jura J, of your, your question? You know, the, the risk of invasiveness from, from, uh, from that process. And I imagine I mean, that is obviously something that one of the, the risks you're having to, to, to factor into the planning for such a thing. Absolutely, and that was the that was the main concern from the invasion biologists that we were by sanctioning assisted colonization. We were really uh, they were worried that we were offering kind of open slather for moving any species anywhere. We saw the same kind of pushback <clears throat> against uh, Richard Hobbs ideas of novel ecosystems. But I think there's a bit more nuance to it in that um, just because you say this is could be a legitimate uh, conservation translocation action doesn't mean you're, you, you don't have the responsibility to try and understand what those impacts would be. So there are, there are if, you, if you suspected that the animal that you were releasing could have unwanted impacts, there are kind of staged ways you could do that to really test some ideas around it. The other thing that guidelines are really strong on is saying, think about your exit strategy. Uh, in the case, in, in this case, it would be, how would you pull those animals back once you've got them, once you've got them out there and you realize they're causing a problem? What is the, the scope or the, the feasibility of, of reversing things? To date, um, we, we don't have a good examples where reintroductions or other kind of translocations have created major problems in, in areas. Um, so it, it, it does remain something to be seen, but in, in some ways, the species that you are translocating for conservation purposes are the ones that, for whatever reason, have been not doing well in a given environment. So they, they tend not to have the same kinds of features that you see with the highly invasive species. But that's not to say it, it might not be a problem for some of the things that have been considered. And Nick was asking, in fact, Nick's question came, Nick, I don't know whether you actually want to ask this and turn on your mic for it, because I might, I might destroy it. <laughs> but, but I think your question came up when you were, um, when, when there were those slides um, looking at the a priori, um, the, 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 the management, how, how we've changed in the way we've been designing these, these practice, these, these uh, projects. Um, and he's asking about, you know, when you, when you're reintroducing or you're, you're, translocating animals into environments where it might be necessary to sort of you know fence off put water holes in you're actually you're almost creating extended uh, enclosures um for these animals um you're, you're you're nodding so i'm presuming you've got a response to that i'm no, not sure whether i'm asking you correctly. yeah it's it's the whole idea of what is wild what's wild anymore and that's been a big debate um, for a number of species that are being managed, including things like Arabian oryx, <clears throat> which may be in fenced reserves, which are very, very large, but uh, the mere fact that they have a fence around them disqualifies them from being counted as wild populations in some jurisdictions. But it really depends on the scale that you're working at. Um, I don't think there's, I, I think, the term wild is used in all sorts of policy documents, but is never defined and never clearly understood. And if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different ideas of what they think a wild species is. For some people, if it's been through captive breeding, if it's even been translocated, it's, it's lost its wildness. Hmm. But given that there are no ecosystems on earth that haven't had our handprint on them somewhere or other, and that everything that's out there to some extent is um, almost being managed. And I, I think it's the understanding that even, even with reintroductions, other kind of translocations, there are very few projects you could then walk away from and be confident that they would persist indefinitely. So we're almost committing ourselves to ongoing management. Sometimes that management may be in the forms of very intensive things like supplementary feeding or water. Sometimes it might be ongoing uh, protection from invasive predators. So in New Zealand, we have eco sanctuaries and mainland islands. And so these are fenced reserves in which uh, flightless bird species or reptile species can persist. 
we consider those to be wild populations at that scale. But if we didn't have a predator proof fence there, they wouldn't be there anymore. So they, they, are, they are management dependent, if you like. And there have been some papers around, you know, Kent Redford and some others have set out a kind of a spectrum of the degrees of intervention from, you know, you're off on your own right through to being totally captively managed. And the wildness will sit somewhere along that spectrum, but it's not clearly defined where that sits. And I suppose, I mean, there's no, again, there's no, um, a single definition of success, or I wouldn't have thought it's right to say what is a definition, full definition of success. It depends what is success to you. But that, again, in the same way as clarity, clarity of objectives is really important also clarity of what good looks like as far as you're concerned the people involved in it even if others might look at it and say that's not you know that's not being achieved well actually if you if you achieve what you wanted to achieve then you've achieved it you know you have if that was sufficient then that's fine and and so actually clarifying what that that expectation is um is uh you know kind of frames the success more effectively, even if you may decide you want to then change from, from that point forward. Yeah, um, Jamie, it's Carolyn here. So one of the other things is also acknowledging the risks and recognising what the risk is and just accepting it. So, um, you know, Phil talked about us putting devils on an island. We knew when we put a predator on an island that it was going to eat the penguin colony, and it did. Um, but there is another island next door that has the penguin colony on it as well. So we assessed that the risk of trying to have some disease free devils um, and lose the colony of penguins was acceptable. Um, we did lose the shearwaters as well, which is not desirable, but they, we're trying to rectify that at the moment. But, but we all recognise that from the moment we were going to put a predator out on an island with a bunch of seabirds, you just have to look at New Zealand to know how that story was going to end. Um, but those of us involved in the program recognised it. And also working with species with disease is another risk that people need to be able to accept because we cannot mitigate the threat of disease in the wild at all. It's anyone who works with frogs as well knows that. And so that was one of the things that we, we had issues with in Australia in regards to the guidelines because it's about um, don't do your reintroduction unless you can mitigate some of the risk. And, and it took a lot of... Kind of conversations with government agencies to get them past the fact that when it's a risk you cannot mitigate the guidelines allow you to still do translocations hmm. that's really like point, Carol. Um, and it was a sticking point in the guidelines because they really are guidelines they're not policy lots but you know they've been taken and used as policy so some of the statements that were supposed to be a bit softer have become kind of you know deal breakers for, for projects I think the, the idea that, you know, don't release things back into an area unless you've dealt with the threats was really to get around the idea that people were just pouring animals out into areas without thinking about why they'd gone extinct in the first place. But the, indeed, there's a bit of nuance in there that's really important. And Jamie's other point about success, that there's a whole session we can do on defining success. It's easy to define failure in reintroductions or translocation because where your animals disappear. But defining success is hard because, you know, when, when do you say done and walk away? And the suggestion is maybe never. So maybe you can never define success. So as Jamie said, the, the approach is to stage it. So actually we're trying to achieve these things in these stages and by all indications we're, we're tracking along. The really important thing, um, and something you would have found as well, Carolyn, is communicating these things to everyone who may have a, have a concern or a decision or a voice, including the risks, including the likelihood. We'd do this, we're doing this, this bad thing could happen. Um, you know, how do people feel about that? Is that worth it? And recognizing that not doing something is a decision as well. It's not just a default. You're making an active decision not to put devils onto Mariah Island. What are the consequences of that? And how does that relate to other? Thank you very much, Phil. I'm aware of the time, so we're probably going to have to wrap up, although there are actually quite a number of questions in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy those and um, uh, I'm, I may um, unfairly to you, Phil, pass them on to you in an email and uh, see if you've got a response to them. And then what I'll do is I will send the, the responses with the questions around to everybody um, to, to, your, to your email. So you've got those answers. Um, 
but we should probably wrap up at this point and uh, say thank you so much. Super interesting. Uh, loads of questions that are coming out. Um, lots of interest in this. And I always kind of hold my breath at the beginning to think, is this going to kind of clash with um, a sort of a philosophy that we're trying to put across around conservation planning whenever we're whenever you know anybody's going to be presenting i shouldn't really have that issue i shouldn't be thinking about that with you but i did and then you have ah oh, wonderful it completely aligns this is we're all saying the same thing so let's get on and do it and make you know so many of these decisions so much a little bit more thoughtful a lot clearer a lot better communicated and we're going to do better work that's oversimplifying an awful lot of <laughs> deep thought that phil took us through um but thank you so much to everybody for attending as well and um uh, we'll let you know uh, when the next uh, webinar is 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 ready to go um do email me if you've got any other questions you'd like to ask and we can forward them on um uh phil do you do you want to say anything else or um no, just thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, these are these are strange times we're in, but we're kind of getting used to this mode of operating, and um, it works. So it's it's fantastic to have the interact with you. Thank you, Phil. I actually feel like I actually have more friends than I really do because I spend my time kind of interacting with these large groups. I feel like I'm actually super social. And then I go up my outside my door and there's a stream and that and then I've got a dog and that's about it. Maybe my wife will speak to me, but that's probably about all. Anyway, you don't need to know more about my uh, my personal problems. Um, I will let you guys go. Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, bye for now. Thank you, Phil. Super.